Blah. Okay, I'll stop doing that now. In this Talking Squid video, I'll briefly cover these three papers about deep machine learning, available on ARCSIV. Uh, I, I mean, archive. The, the X is a chi. I'll try implementing lessons from the papers into deep learning models, which add captions to pictures from Flickr, or make new pictures of Pokemon. But look, I have a bachelor's in math and now a master's in data science. But for me to imply that I know what I'm talking about might be stretching it. My dad told me when he took math in college, he learned it, but he didn't understand it. It was only his fourth or fifth time learning it again later in life that he actually saw the reasoning behind the, the, the reasoning. So while I reckon I'm starting to grok this stuff, this talking squid video isn't worth citing in any dissertations or anything. You may have heard of OpenAI's GPT-3 language model through the text-based adventure game Dungeon AI, where you can write basically anything and the game will help automatically continue an admittedly odd story. We're gonna do a custom prompt. You are in a spooky, haunted mansion when you bump into Dan Aykroyd. How does GPT-3 work? Juan Li, PhD from LambdaLabs.com wrote this 2020 article about the language model's specs. GPT-3 has eight models of different sizes, the largest having 175 billion parameters. In comparison, the deep learning models I've made on this channel have had like 10 million parameters max. GPT-3 is catching up to the human brain's 100 trillion synapses. Mathematicians hesitate to talk about neural networks like actual neurons, but the numbers are still chilling. GPT-3 was given 499 billion tokens, like word bits, gathered online or in books. GPT-3 trained up trying to predict the next token given prior tokens. For all the effort, GPT-3 can write an article based on a title you give it, which humans can only separate from actual articles with about a 50-50 shot. In Dungeon AI, given just a nudge, GPT-3 can continue any old story coherently-ish. You blink and the cat is gone. Oh, spooky cat. Did you see that cat, Dan? What? Where? He asks. You point down to the floor and say, There was a white cat right there and now it's gone. <laughs> We're in a haunted house of horrors. Of course there's ghosts here, he says. Okay. You're not wrong, but... The largest GPT-3 model has 96 attention layers. I learned a lot making talking squid videos about convolutional layers and recursive layers, so now I want to learn about attention in the usual thinkster way. Before opening that first paper from Google about attention, let's open a Python tutorial which pops up when I Google attention. Well, actually, the tutorial I picked didn't implement attention layers. It just mentioned attention layers might be helpful. I should have finished reading the tutorial before settling on it, but hey, more practice for me. The Flickr 8K dataset has 8,000 pictures from Flickr. Each picture has five captions provided by humans, typos and everything. 6,000 pictures and their 30,000 captions are in a training set, and the rest are set aside to test our model generating automatic captions. The tutorial kicks out rare words used less than 10 times total, which conveniently removes most typos. Then the tutorial adds a start sequence token to the beginning of every caption and a stop sequence token to the end of every caption. All these words are made into numbers, just like the IMDB reviews in my last math video. And all the numbers are broken up into sequences of numbers in a row, and the one number following. If a caption is, say, 10 words long, that's 11 opportunities for training, because we can feed our model just the start sequence token to ask what word begins this caption. 
then we can feed it the first word too, and let it guess the second word, and then feed it the second word too, and let it guess the third word, until we feed it all ten words to teach where end sequence tokens pop in. The number lists are padded with zeros, so all these training captions are the same length. I've made some neural networks which look at pictures, but Google has made a better one. Inception V3 was introduced for the 2012 ImageNet Recognition Challenge, and yes, it is named after the movie. Trained on a big old dataset of labeled images, Inception V3 correctly classified test images into 1,000 different categories with astonishing accuracy. Now, that is related to adding captions to pictures, but it's not all the way there. The tutorial takes Inception V3, oh, a big complicated boy, isn't he? The combination of long scenic routes and shortcuts between them is called a ResNet, I think. Anyway, the tutorial takes Inception V3 and chops off the last layer, the part which classifies images into a thousand categories. When this sort of headless model is fed images, they are reduced in size from 299 by 299 by 3 integers for red, green, blue, to 2048 floats. The images become embeddings with insight into their contents, as if the embeddings were about to be categorized by that layer we chopped off. We call this sort of Frankensteining transfer learning. Likewise, we don't have to train our model to interpret these word numbers. We can take the glove word to vec I used in my last math video and stitch it directly onto the model. Sort of human centipede style. Jeez, what a reference. But hey, that's transfer learning. Happy Halloween. The tutorial has a great picture of the whole model's captioning process. Captions to be continued are embedded with the word to vec, then fed through a long short-term memory layer to consider the words in order and return an overall takeaway with a vector of 256 floating point numbers. The image already embedded by Inception V3 is fed through a dense layer to become another 256 float vector. Both 256 float vectors are added together in the tutorial, but I concatenated them instead since adding the two sources of information seemed more appropriate for a ResNet's forked path, and my results were about the same either way. Whether adding or concatenating, the resulting vector goes through another dense layer, and finally an output layer which uses softmax activation to describe the probability of each possible word being the next word in the caption. So, wow. How do we use this model to make a whole new caption? First, embed a new image with Inception V3. Feed that embedding image into this side of the model while feeding the other side of the model the start sequence token. Whichever word the model thinks is most likely to come next, that's an argmax, Assume that word is correct, and run the model again, with the same image, but with that word added to the caption. If that word is the stop sequence token, or we've hit the maximum caption length, the model quits there. This is a greedy algorithm, just picking the best immediate option at any time. I tried implementing a beam search, which considered a few words at once and in a row, but it worked a little bit, um, funky. Before the model is trained, it gives images nonsense captions, repetitive ones too, like the word adult 34 times, or various various nearby various nearby nearby base nearby base 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 and so on. After some training, not bad captions at all. Motorcyclist is riding an orange motorcycle. Sounds about right. But some of them are questionable. Man in a black shirt is skateboarding down ramp. Not, not quite. The sky is black, not his shirt. Man in a guitar for A. Hmm. But so far, we haven't actually used any attention. How can we fit an attention layer in here? There are two ways, and I tried both at once. 
Google popularized attention in the paper Attention is All You Need. They describe a model architecture called a transformer, totally attention-based, which can discover global dependencies. Compare that to a recurrent layer like an LSTM, whose sequential view has issues like vanishing gradients, preventing such global perspective. So how does attention work? Hold on to your hats. <clears throat> An attention function can be described as mapping a query and a set of key-value pairs to an output, where the query, keys, values, and output are all vectors. The output is computed as a weighted sum of the values, where the weight assigned to each value is computed by a compatibility function of the query with the corresponding key. Okay. That's a lot to take in, but I think I get it. A query contains information which keys might recognize, not recognize, or somewhere in between. The more a key relates to a query, the heavier its value is weighted in the output. Scaled dot product attention involves softmaxing, as if the values are weighted by their keys proportion of the total relevance of all keys. Multi-headed attention means there are multiple collections of queries, keys, and values, which each produce their own outputs to be concatenated together. Whereas recurrent networks have a sense of positional order because they work sequentially, Google's attention uses positional encoding, so each element of the input is associated with a sinusoidal function. Comparing these positional encodings gives elements an absolute position in the input and relative position to each other. I put this kind of attention layer in my caption generator just before the LSTM layer, so the LSTM layer knows which words are the most relevant, I guess. But Google has described another way to implement attention in the paper Attention Augmented Convolutional Networks. Convolution is great for local knowledge, seeing relationships between elements within the kernel together, and the knowledge is translation equivariant, so those kernels can go anywhere. Attention's global perspective would be helpful too, if it could be expanded to higher dimensions. So the paper develops a novel two-dimensional relative self-attention mechanism that maintains translation equivariance while being infused with relative position information, making it well-suited to images. They do this by applying regular old convolution and reshaping the same input into something appropriate for attention, giving it two-dimensional relative self-attention by independently adding relative height information and relative width information. Then reshape the attention's output to match the convolution and concatenate the two together. With the attention augmentation, the paper gets better results from the convolution with fewer parameters. I was able to implement this into the caption generator too, I cut off another layer of Inception v3, so images were embedded as the kind of higher-dimensional tensors fit for convolution. I suppose this attention-augmented convolution layer is telling the model which aspects of the image to consider. I'm not totally happy with the approach I've taken in this, because it doesn't seem like the attention layers get to corroborate about what they consider important. But this is a learning experience, and I learned. It makes okay captions, like close-up of football player in white stripe and helmet in stadium. All right, fair enough. But man in white shirt is sitting at table filled with her fingers just makes me want to write a short story. But first, seeing this tutorial build a model with two different inputs, in image and natural language, I want to try another generative adversarial network. I'm no longer satisfied by the Dr. Seussian numbers I got from my GAN. Sure, I taught a computer to make images which kind of look like numbers, but which numbers? 
I made a new generative adversarial network, which not only uses attention augmented convolution, but also has two inputs and two outputs. The typical GAN input is noise, or seeds, which the generator turns into an image. The typical GAN output is a number between 0 and 1. The discriminator's confidence that an image is a legitimate one versus one of the generator's fakes. I gave the discriminator another output so it predicts which number each image represents. And I gave the generator another input so it makes images which the discriminator identifies as particular numbers. This makes such good numbers, you squidlings. Giving the generator this goal, make this noise into a 4, make this noise into a 6, gets the numbers looking immediately recognizable. I made a shape-shifting number GIF, 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 which includes all the digits from 0 to 9 generated from the same noise each frame as that noise transitions from one seed to another. In each frame generated by the same noise, all ten digits look like they were written by the same person with the same pen. I made this GIF, 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 every epoch, so I can make all their first frames into another GIF, showing the model's improvement over time, again with the same noise. Nice. In my last GAN video, I tried generating fake Pokémon and got Pokémon-flavored vomit. Since then, I've found another set of Pokémon images on Pinterest, which I think will be more agreeable to work with. I set up some attention layers and started cracking. And would you look at that? Those are Blorpomon! Those are totally Blorpomon! But do you see how in every epoch, these nine random seeds produce Blorpomon of the same color? This bothered me, and when I looked into it, I found a paper from Tsinghua University called ColorNet, investigating the importance of color spaces for image classification. To quote, Color spaces can also be thought of as an abstract mathematical model which helps us to describe colors as numbers. The typical color space is red, green, blue, RGB. There are other ways to describe colors, like cyan, magenta, yellow, CMY, hue, saturation value, HSV, yuv, yik, and XYZ. While an image will look the same to us, no matter how it's rendered, transforming an image into different color spaces should yield new images in the view of the computer. So combining the outputs for each color space can help a model understand an image by viewing it from multiple perspectives at once, so to speak. It's possible to convert one color space to another with exactly the sort of linear algebra neural networks use. But if we just provide the alternative color space, we save the model a few steps and can cut down on parameters that need to be trained. The paper's use of color spaces improves some results in categorization accuracy, but I didn't get much luck including HSV conversion in my GANs discriminator. The generator just got kinda colory. I suppose I'm not surprised. In HSV, two shades of red which look similar to us might seem like total opposites to the computer. But I did add grayscale, working with red, green, blue, grays, even if it didn't solve the Blorpomon color issue that got me started on all this. Anyway, I have one more thing to mention, and I don't have any papers to reference for it. I'm talking out my little squiddy sphincter again. I've mentioned before, dropping out data at random during training, or adding noise to images during training, might improve a model's performance by forcing it to generalize instead of just memorizing very specific cases. A lot of tutorials, GANs, have a dropout layer in the discriminator. I decided to get a little more complicated by adding noise, which decreased in scale every epoch. It's easy to imagine applying noise to an image, like there's rainbow dust blown all over it. I also applied noise to hidden layers within the generator and discriminator, which can't be easily visualized. Images fed to the discriminator are also blurred. We can visualize that, too. Every epoch, the blur and the noise are dialed down a bit, so the models are less and less restrained. 
my hypothesis, which might not be correct, but at least rendered some nice blorpomon, was that beginning the GAN with lots of noise would force the generator and discriminator to learn the largest, most general features of Pokemans first. Otherwise, the GAN might tend to obsess over small details, without even considering the placement of those details. As noise decreases epoch to epoch, the models see the small details after they've got the bigger stuff sorted out. I clearly don't know everything there is to know about attention layers, but I definitely know more than I did when I started. That's all I really hope for here at Thinkster. I'll close this video on another dataset of abstract patterns from Africa. My GAN doesn't seem to generate abstract patterns from Africa, but its output is pretty artsy anyway. Bye-bye.